Hi, everybody. My name is Paul Brody. I'm the Global Blockchain Leader at EY, and I am really delighted to be able to talk to you today. I'm actually really sorry that I can't be there in person, but I can only be in one place at a time, and I already made a commitment for the exact same date and time. But I am excited to talk to you about blockchain technology. In particular, my own experience in South Korea has been very important to me over the years. I actually started working in South Korea when I was at McKinsey in 1996. I came back numerous times over the years at many of the technology startups I worked at and later when I worked at IBM. In fact, it was about 10 years ago this year when I was working at IBM that I got involved in my very first blockchain project. And it was actually with Samsung Electronics. It was with the Multimedia Solutions Center at Samsung. And we were looking at this question of if smart devices are so smart, why do we also need server infrastructure to manage them? Can't all these smart devices manage themselves and work with each other. And so to do that, we set up a distributed computing architecture and we started looking into all of these different options. One of them was Bitcoin and another ended up being the alpha version of Ethereum. And sure enough, we met with Vitalik Buterin. We worked on the alpha version of Ethereum and we created something called Autonomous Decentralized Peer-to-Peer -peer Telemetry System. And we showed it the prototype for the very first time at the Consumer Electronics Show, January of 2015 at CES, after working on it for more than a year. And I'm just gonna share with you a great picture from this. That's me in the center looking much younger. And off to my right are the IBM team that we assemble. And off to my left is a Samsung team. And right next to me on the left-hand side is somebody that many of you may recognize. It's Vitalik Buterin. And that's us standing in front of the entrance to the Samsung booth at CES in January 2015, where we showed off our prototype. Now, not long after that time period, IBM decided that initially they weren't interested in blockchain. Now, later on, they decided that they very much were. But by then, I'd actually packed up and left and gone off to EY, where I really got to pursue blockchain technology. And I've been here ever since, mostly working on figuring out how to make blockchain useful for enterprises. There are so many fantastic use cases for blockchain in finance and industry. We all know about the finance use cases, payments, loans, liquidity services, prediction markets, bonds, tokenized digital assets. The world of finance is really, really well explored in the world of blockchain technology. What we spend a lot less time talking about are all the incredible opportunities in the industrial space. And there are enormous numbers of them. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about them today. But if you want to read more about it, I actually wrote an entire book on blockchain technology and its use cases. It's called Ethereum for Business. And uh, you can pick it up. It's the perfect gift uh, for your family, for your friends, for your children. I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, it is available. And by the way, every single penny of the royalties goes to fund blockchain public goods through Gitcoin. Now, let me talk a little bit about all these different use cases and where I see things going, because even though the market is in the doldrums, this business has been incredibly, incredibly busy. And it's reasonable to ask over the last few years, if blockchain is so great for all these different use cases, why are we making so little progress in adoption? The market has plunged, the volume of people working on this stuff has decreased significantly. And I think there are four big obstacles that have been holding this entire industry back around this industry. First and foremost, regulator, regulatory clarity. Secondly, strategic clarity. Thirdly, technology scalability. And lastly, privacy. And I'm going to spend just a couple minutes digging into each one of these topics because they're all special and challenges, but we are all overcoming them. If I have a message for you today, it's that I am incredibly optimistic about the future of our business. Let's start with regulatory clarity because this one is incredibly important, especially for financial services and for the overall market confidence. So part of the value proposition of the things that are, are, are needed are punishment of people who did bad things. Right? That is an important thing and it is happening, maybe not as fast as we would like, but it is happening. But secondly, we need good positive rules for enterprises and financial services companies to actually play in this market. They have to know what are the rules, how do they play by them, how do they deliver products that are for clients. I think in spite of a lot of challenges, we are actually getting it, right. The most important activity that's going on 
is the MICA legislation in Europe. Europe is the world's second largest financial market. It's got the most constructive, progressive regulatory environment. The Markets and Crypto Assets Act, which start, goes into effect next year over a period of about 18 months, starting in June, will pave the way for regulated structures almost for almost all kinds of digital assets. And very importantly, it also covers structure for stable coins. And I think as we get going forward, stable coins in particular are the foundation for good regulation of what will come later, which are decentralized financial services. So regulatory clarity is important. Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, all delivering excellent, progressive, constructive regulatory regimes. The UK is moving on that as well. We are absolutely lagging behind in this respect in the United States. But overall, I think things are moving in the right direction. And I particularly call out the European Union, both for the constructive nature of the legislation and the very large size of that market. I think it will trigger a wave of significant growth in this space next year. The second important topic is what I would call strategic clarity, which is maybe a nice way of saying we need governments to stop messing around, governments and enterprises, to stop messing around with this concept of private or permission blockchains. It's not that they can't work technically, although they have a lot of challenges with them. It's that they make no sense. There is no point in having a centrally managed, decentralized ledger. If you can agree on a single entity to run your blockchain, then you don't need a blockchain. You just need a centralized server. And indeed, if you look at governments that are thinking seriously about central bank digital currencies, many of them are adopting ideas like tokenization, but not blockchain technology. The problem is that decentralization is the point. And the reason it's the point, particularly in the world of business, is that what we have seen over and over again is that as digital companies become very large connectors of buyers and sellers, what happens is they go through an evolution. At the beginning of their era, they are just really helpful in connecting buyers and sellers. But over time, because of Metcalfe's law, because of the power of network effects, almost all these really successful companies eventually become dominant monopolies. And as they become dominant monopolies, their model switches from just helpfully connecting buyers and sellers and facilitating markets into extractive monopolies, where they start to take much more than their fair share of the value that's created by the market participants. This is holding back the value and growth of the entire e-commerce environment, most especially in the business-to-business -business space. In fact, decentralization, the importance of decentralization is why almost all of these private blockchain or permission blockchain environments end up failing. Because in the end, to believe in a permission blockchain means that you must trust the centralized market operator. And the reality is that even if those central market operators start with very good intentions, they finish with very bad results. I don't want to name names here, but you all know the companies that I'm talking about. Mostly today, it's in the consumer space. It's one of the reasons why enterprises haven't adopted this technology is their fear of waking up in a future where the core of their business and the value they create is mostly absorbed by some kind of digital intermediary. The third big challenge is technology scalability. I really believe for the most part, this problem has largely been solved. Over the last year, what we've seen is that L2 transactions, layer two transactions on top of Ethereum have become the dominant form of Ethereum transaction. This is fantastic. What this means is that whereas 12 or 18 months ago, you could do about a million transactions a day on Ethereum. Today, realistically, if you added up the capacity across all of these layer two networks, you're talking about hundreds of millions of transactions a day in capacity. We ourselves at EY have built and developed an L2 network for Ethereum that can theoretically do almost 400 million transactions a day with privacy. And I'm gonna come back to that particular topic in a moment. But my point here is maybe two points really. Number one, scalability is not perfect. We need to get from hundreds of millions of transactions a day to potentially, if we bring on many of the world's major industries, we estimate 40 billion transactions a day is a capacity needed for major industrial production. But I believe for the moment, we are growing capacity or we're growing the theoretical capacity of the Ethereum ecosystem much faster than the actual requirement for it. 
And related to that is something you probably are already detecting from me, which is that I really believe Ethereum is becoming the dominant blockchain ecosystem. Just like in any other technology industry, the world loves a standard. We don't really have lots of different networking protocols or infrastructure. We tend to have, in any particular market, a single dominant platform. I think that's, that trend is basically being replicated again in Ethereum. Lastly, it's important to talk about privacy because privacy is really important in finance, but it's even more important for industrial applications. And the reason for that very simply is that if you're an enterprise, you want to do something like inventory management, or you want to have an automated procurement relationship with your business partner or track your products or manage your trade across borders, it's really important that your competition cannot see what you're doing. And the problem with a lot of blockchain infrastructure by default is that it becomes very easily visible. It's very easy if you do lots of transactions, especially if you do them with non-fungible tokens, it's easy for us to figure out who you are transacting with and what you're doing. That is sensitive business information for enterprises. And so privacy is essential for enabling enterprise business models. And the reality is that that until very recently, privacy hasn't really been a functional capability. Now, the connections today that exist between companies are all digital. That is for sure, but mostly they're very unsophisticated forms of digital assets. With privacy, we can take these digital silos that are connected by fax or EDI, or sending around PDFs, and we can turn them into this continuously integrated blockchain-based business ecosystem where you can have real continuity of data and information and business rules from one end to another. So if you think about a typical supply chain, you can create digital tokens for the assets. You can move them from manufacturer to integrator, out to distributor and through the transport system. And you can use smart contracts to basically manage those business relationships, things like volume discounts, special pricing agreements, price lists. And if you could do those things with privacy, you can build a really robust model where instead of recreating data at every company, you're actually moving the token. And when you move a token, you're moving the data and you have shared digital business agreements between enterprises. At the end of the day, I think this is the key to unlocking almost all of these enterprise use cases is the ability to represent a business transaction with tokens and smart contracts and to be able to do so under privacy. As I tell a lot of people I work with, basically almost every B2B transaction is basically, I have money, you have some product or service that I want, and we're gonna exchange my money for your product or service under the terms of some kind of agreement. And both of those things need to be private in order for us to have a successful transaction. From an EY perspective, our big focus has been on this privacy. So if you talk to people about L2s and their plans for growing Ethereum, nine times out of 10, they'll talk to you about transaction scalability, how to do more transactions, how to do them faster. I've always believed that before we can ever really get to a really big scalability requirement, we need privacy. And so this has been our focus over the, over the last seven years, figuring out how to do this well and to do it at scale. And in pursuit of that, EY has built two really important solutions that we have worked on with others. We've been the primary builders and we have donated into the public domain for anyone to use. The first is called Nightfall. Nightfall is an L2 for EVM network environment that runs on top of Ethereum. It's live today, also on top of the Polygon proof of stake network. And it is an enterprise focused layer two network. Secondly, we built an application called Starlight. And what Starlight does is really cool. It basically lets you take a Solidity smart contract, standard Ethereum smart contract, and mark it up with the parts of it that you want private, and recompile it and deploy it onto Ethereum 
as a zero knowledge circuit, privacy enabled black box. If you want to learn more about both of those, you can go visit our GitHub online. It's github.com slash EY blockchain to find out more and understand what it is that we are doing. Now, just to give you a little bit of a sense of how long it has taken, we started work on this in 2017. And we're currently, after six years, we're on version three. What once cost us $100 a transaction when we showed the prototype, we're now down to about 30 cents on the main net and about sub one penny on the Polygon Proof of Stake network. And our goal by next year in 2024 is to get to an even more efficient and faster version. How much value do we think is at stake if we can put these things together? I think the answer is an enormous amount. And I just wanna share with you one example. It's a little bit of a brag, but please forgive me. This is the work that EY did for Microsoft. And what we did was we worked with Microsoft to take the business contracts that are run on the Xbox video game network and turn them into digital smart contracts. So Microsoft has thousands and thousands of contracts with many different business partners. And each one is similar, but they're all a little bit unique. It depends on what Microsoft is buying. There's different uh, discounts and revenue terms. And there are rules like you sell so much of this video game, we get a slightly higher share of the revenue. Just pretty typical high volume business. Because there were so many and the rules were a little bit different for each one, Microsoft was having trouble in the traditional ERP environment of processing all of those contracts and giving people data every month. When we move those contracts from paper and semi-automated systems with ERP onto blockchain-based smart contracts on an Ethereum private network, the cycle time required to calculate a statement basically went from 45 days down to about four minutes. Pretty much within four or five minutes, every company working on the Xbox network knows where they, where they stand with Microsoft's payments and systems. Secondly, the whole system, including design, build, transfer of all the contracts, costs about half of what it cost a previous system to run when we take into account all the administrative complexity. And then lastly, the level of trust involved in the business partners is much higher because they can see what's happening much more quickly, and they can even get some pretty granular detail on how the rules of their business relationship are being applied. So this is a huge success. Now, we had to build this about five years ago on a private Ethereum network. What I'm really proud of is that with Starlight and Nightfall, we can take this same technology now and deploy similar solutions for other companies on the public Ethereum network. No need to build your own blockchain, no need to force all of your suppliers to come on board to a proprietary network, just using open standards on the public Ethereum network. So I believe there's a huge future for value creation in this digital blockchain ecosystem. Now, I want to finish up this conversation, and I greatly appreciate all your patience in listening to me. I'm not there in person. I don't know how many of you have already fallen asleep. But I want to talk a little bit about the future, because one of the things that, that I struggle with is that I think everybody believes that the future is coming in a year or two. It's really big. Digital industrial transformations are not one, two, three, four, five-year projects. They take decades. 25, 30, 40 years. Enterprise systems move slowly and they need to operate with extreme reliability. And one of my favorite examples is just sharing with you the history of SWIFT. People talk a lot about SWIFT, how it's the incumbent global financial payment system. What they often don't realize is it took about 40 years for SWIFT to get there. It took about 20 years to build out all those banks that are participating in SWIFT. Something like 80% of the banks that are on SWIFT had to be between 1979 and 1999. What's really notable, though, is that the volume of transactions, the real value from the network, didn't really start growing until about the year 2000. By 2019, the network was doing eight times the volume of transactions that it was doing back in 1999. 
SWIFT is a global incumbent. It's a 40-year-old project. We should be thinking about the future of blockchain growth, not as a one or a three or a five-year thing, but as a 30, 40, and 50-year project to transform how enterprises transact with each other. Before I close up, I'm just going to show you a little QR code on the screen. If you scan that QR code, you can have a free NFT from EY if you have a wallet on the Polygon Proof of Stake Network. So thanks a lot and have a terrific event. And thank you for having me.